Chapter 9, Part C How to Revitalize the Militia of the Several States The most important mission of each and every CHSA will be to develop an experimentally tested and proven program for revitalizing the militia in its particular state and locale in the closest possible conformity with the pattern of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia. To this end, members must educate themselves as to 1. What organizational forms, composition of personnel, equipment, training, homeland security functions, and so on, will be most suitable for militia companies and other units in the various parts of the state in which each CHSA is located. 2. What statutes the state's legislature will need to enact, amend, and repeal in order to revitalize her militia at the earliest possible moment, with the least social disruption, in keeping with the structures and operations the CHSAs have devised and tested, and three, what the members of each CHSA, as well as all other citizens in the state, should be prepared to do individually and in cooperation with others, to maintain homeland security in their own areas if major crises break out before revitalization of the militia occurs. B. Practical studies must be the second highest priority for every CHSA. This includes theorizing about what typical militia units should do and how they should do it, then experimenting to test the theory, then employing the successful results of the experiments as the basis for legislation. It does not include claiming to be, let alone operating as, a private militia or other paramilitary organization. As this book concerns itself only with general principles and prescriptions, and does not purport to offer a manual of specific procedures and practices, it cannot provide even a minimal catalog of necessary militia organization, equipment, tactics, and so on. Neither need it do so, for in the final analysis, compiling such a catalog will be the task of the CHSAs themselves. Nonetheless, some suggestions are not out of place here. The purpose of practical studies, the why, must be fourfold. First, to enable each CHSA to design and test a model for a militia company or other unit capable of operating under its own local conditions. Second, to assemble within, or known to, each CHSA a set of individuals committed, ready, and able to volunteer for their state's militia when the necessary statutes are enacted. Third, to provide credibility to the movement for revitalizing the militia by demonstrating to legislators how militia companies and other units should be structured, and proving to them that their constituents in general and their own neighbors in particular, in sufficient numbers and with sufficient knowledge, skills, and motivation, are prepared to assume the burdens of militia service if the representatives will only assist them in doing so. Fourth to provide information and encouragement to the local community, so that if the militia are not revitalized in time, we the people ourselves can take on the vital functions of homeland security in our states and localities during the course of any economic, social, or political crises in which the police and other regularly constituted agencies are unable or unwilling to provide the community with adequate protection. The direction of practical studies, the where, will depend upon the particular issues of homeland security most relevant to each state and locality, the strengths, weaknesses, and lacunae in the relevant state and local laws, how many volunteers may be anticipated for the revitalized militia in different locales, particularly immediately upon passage of the statute revitalizing the militia in that state, and the material resources that are already available in the area, that could be made available or that will likely be available on a timely basis. For example, the state of Rhode Island's promotional motto, the Ocean State, reflects the extensive length of coastline and numerous islands within her jurisdiction. In Rhode Island, therefore, homeland security and her revitalized militia will need to focus on 1. Executing the laws and repelling invasions through such Coast Guard activities as interdicting smuggling of illicit commodities, intercepting illegal aliens who approach by sea, and investigating potential terrorist sabotage of 
or other attacks on or threats to shipping, shipyards, harbors, waterways, and adjacent facilities. And two, preparing for and dealing with the aftermaths of hurricanes and other natural disasters that disproportionately affect coastal regions. For this reason, the revitalized Rhode Island militia will doubtlessly develop more naval contingents in preference to land forces than other states not similarly situated. This nautical emphasis, though, will surely appeal to Rhode Islanders steeped in seafaring traditions, and thereby will stimulate recruiting. The state of New Hampshire, distinguishably, has a short coastline, but does share an international border with Canada. Therefore, New Hampshire's revitalized militia will need to develop expertise in border patrol activities, liaison, cooperation, and even joint operations with Canadian authorities and other matters not relevant in Rhode Island. For a final example, the Commonwealth of Virginia has a long coastline, but no international border. Of far more significance than these facts, however, is her proximity to and interconnections and interdependence with the District of Columbia, which, as the seat of the general government, and the very lair of the great Satan in the minds of radical Muslims, could be a prime target for the most serious kinds of terrorist strikes. Thus, homeland security in Northern Virginia will inevitably focus on such horrendous possibilities as nuclear, chemical, and biological attacks on the district, and how those would affect the neighboring Virginia counties through emergency evacuations, quarantines of large sectors of the district and adjoining areas, or suspensions of air, rail, and other major highway traffic into and out of the greater Washington area. Obviously, a strong an emphasis on these matters will probably be necessary in Tidewater, Virginia, or in such hinterlands as the Shenandoah Valley. On the other hand, Rhode Island, in Portsmouth and Newport, New Hampshire, in Portsmouth, and Virginia, in Newport News and Norfolk, all contain major shipbuilding or naval facilities, or both, as to which the preparedness of each of the revitalized militia will probably follow similar lines. The method of practical studies, the how, must be eclectic, experimental, evolutionary, and above all, energetic. The goal is to develop not the mindless discipline of robotic responses to stereotyped situations, but the flexibility that can tailor make unique solutions to whatever problems of homeland security the militia may face as those problems arise. Studies should be based on sound theory, prepared by thorough planning, and carried out in demanding practical studies in order to postulate and then prove or disprove what, how, why, and for whom particular methods for achieving homeland security can be expected to work or not in particular circumstances. The type and timing of practical studies, the what and the when, must encompass three everies. Everything, everywhere, and at every moment. They must admit no arbitrary boundaries of time, space, or substance. Within legal limits and the ability of their CHSA to finance it, members' studies must be increasingly realistic, varied, challenging, rigorous, and demanding. Tested in different situations in diverse environments at diverse times of the year, members will learn how revitalized militia should face unexpected problems and apply novel solutions, not only so that the CHSA can pique their interest, retain their involvement, and take organizational pride in their record of accomplishment, but also so that it can prove to legislators and to the general public that just as the originality of its problems characterize modern homeland security, the originality of their solutions to those problems will characterize the revitalized militia. Ideally, a CHSA should conduct at least one regular problem every week. Subjects should include militia organization, equipment and functions, public education, legislative relations, and how proposed bills for, for revitalization of the militia 
would work in practice. Given the urgency of the situation this country faces, such a schedule, although ambitious, is not excessive. In order to avoid detractors' hysterical charges that the CHSA is conducting private military maneuvers, its problems should consist primarily of simulations on paper, a desktop, a sand table, or a computer screen. Participants should understand and engage in these problems as militia studies, not private militia or other paramilitary exercises. After all, the goal of these endeavors is not to create or train a private militia, but instead to convince the general public and the legislators to revitalize the constitutional militia by providing in principle that it can be done, and by providing experienced and enthusiastic cadres to put the legislation into practice as soon as it is enacted. In addition, CHSAs need to stress that not just their own members, but all adult American citizens who are not legally disqualified should supply themselves as soon as practicable with firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements sufficient for any reasonable foreseeable contingency that may require their service in the militia. This is especially important with regard to ammunition, emergency water and foodstuffs, and medical supplies, of which there can never be too much. In all of these matters, CHSA should place the strongest possible emphasis on and inculcate in their members and leaders a respect and demand for individual preparedness and individual initiative. A rigid formalistic structure of rote commands and mechanical operations should never be allowed to insinuate itself into, let alone take a hold of, any CHSA. Rather, CHSAs must encourage, bring out, reward, and above all, actually employ to maximum effect their members' self-reliance, unorthodoxy, inspiration, imagination, ingenuity, independence in thought and action, willingness to assume responsibility and undertake tasks on their own recognizance, capability to improvise, sufficient adaptability to take immediate advantage of others' insights, ability to anticipate, cope with, overcome, and profit from the unexpected, and resilience and indefatigability in the face of adversity. Finally, every CHSA should scrupulously avoid any and all activities that might even arguably bring it within national, state, or local statutes or ordinances prescribing or regulating various types of private, paramilitary, or kindred activity. In the highly charged political climate surrounding homeland security today, no CHSA can ever be guaranteed that it will never be wrongfully labeled and targeted by opponents, as supposedly subject to prohibition or draconian regulation under color of some such statute. To forfend that eventuality, CHSAs must 1. Structure themselves and conduct their activities so as not to come within the terms of any such statutes, or 2. Obtain an official, written opinion or other ruling from the state's attorney general or from the local state's attorney with jurisdiction in a particular area, that CHSAs in that state or locality are not within the reach of such statutes. Or three, comply with the requirements of the statutes to the extent they are constitutional and otherwise valid. Or four, challenge the statute's constitutionality in actions for declaratory judgment, in injunctive relief in appropriate courts, before the statutes are applied to them or to any of their members. For example, to avoid certain congressional prohibitions particularly pertinent in this area of international terrorism, each CHSA in every state should explicitly set out in a statement of purposes and operations to which every member must subscribe that it 1 supports the revitalization of the militia of the several states solely by constitutional means. 2. Supports and defends, in all other particulars, the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state in which the CHSA is located. 3. 
will engage in no activity, a goal, aim, purpose, or intent of which is to control by force or violence, or to overthrow either A, the government of the United States or the government of any state, or B, the Constitution and laws of the United States or the Constitution and laws of any state. 4 will accept or retain as a member no individual who advocates the control by force or violence, supplantation, or overthrow of a. the government of the United States or government of any state, or b. the Constitution and laws of the United States or the Constitution and laws of any state. 5. is not subject to foreign control or influence. 6 will not knowingly or willfully solicit or accept contributions of money or any other thing of value, loans, or support of any other kind, directly or indirectly, from a. any foreign government or political subdivision thereof, b. any officer, agent, agency, or instrumentality of any foreign government or political subdivision thereof, c. any political party in or of a foreign country, or d any international political organization. 7. Will accept or retain as a member no individual who is an agent of any foreign government, or who puts his loyalty to any foreign country or to any international or supranational organization ahead of their loyalty to the United States. 8. Will not teach or demonstrate to any individual the use, application, or making of any firearm or explosive or incendiary device, or technique capable of causing injury or death to persons, knowing or having reason to know, or intending, that the same will be unlawfully employed for use in or in furtherance of a civil disorder. 9. Will not transport or manufacture any firearm, or explosive or incendiary device, knowing or having reason to know, or intending that the same will be used unlawfully in furtherance of a civil disorder, and 10. Will maintain no association, relationship, or other connection with any individual, group, or organization who or which it reasonably suspects may have links to terrorists or terrorism, domestic or foreign. Specifically, to obviate problems in Virginia, for example, each CHSA in that state should explicitly set out in a statement of purposes and operations to which every member must subscribe that 1. None of its members will teach or demonstrate to any person the use, application, or making of any firearm, explosive, or incendiary device, or technique capable of causing injury or death to persons, knowing or having reason to know or intending that such training will be employed for use in or in furtherance of any public disturbance within the United States or any territorial possessions thereof involving acts of violence by assemblages of three or more persons, which causes an immediate danger of or result in damage or injury to the person or property of any individual. 2. None of its members will assemble with one or more persons for the purpose of training with practicing with or being instructed in the use of any firearm, explosive or incendiary device, or technique capable of causing injury or death to persons, intending to employ such training for use in or in furtherance of any public disturbance within the United States or any territorial possessions thereof, including acts of violence by assemblages of three or more persons, which causes immediate danger of or results in damage or injury to the person or property of any individual. And 3. All of its members who, individually or collectively, may teach or practice the safe handling and use of firearms, target shooting, and self-defense with firearms, or who may teach or practice other techniques of self-defense or martial arts, will do so only in compliance with all applicable national, state, and local laws, ordinances, and regulations. And so for other states with similar statutes, different considerations may arise under other statutes and bring with them their own difficult problems of legal analysis. The foregoing does not pretend to present a comprehensive list, let alone an exhaustive analysis 
of all the statutes and ordinances that might arguably apply, or be twisted in an effort to make them appear to apply to a CHSA's program in each of the 50 states, or even in the states actually mentioned. But these illustrations do sufficiently emphasize why, before even organizing any CHSA, let alone commencing its operations, its core leader should consult sufficiently experienced and motivated legal counsel, who should perform their own research as to what statutes, ordinances, and regulations of this type might need to be taken into account. Communications among CHSAs, both within a state and among the several states, must also be a task with high priority because the movement to revitalize the militia of the several states will begin only very late in the day, and in most cases CHSAs will start with few personnel and scant resources. CHSAs cannot afford to waste time, individuals' efforts, and money accumulating the same useful information, developing the same successful programs, and especially making the same mistakes, each in isolation from the others. Monopolies on knowledge of what constitutes success and what constitutes failure will only minimize the one and maximize the other, whereas sharing knowledge will multiply every CHSA's effectiveness. Therefore, CHSAs will need to apprise each other of useful information as it accumulates, as well as of opportunities before they pass, difficulties before they arise, pitfalls before they are encountered, and dangers before they become disasters. To this end, each CHSA should appoint a Committee of Correspondence, composed of individuals competent in information technology, initially, to share information on its own activities with and to coordinate its operations with those of other CHSAs in its locality, then to participate in the statewide and eventually nationwide networks linking CHSAs as these develop, and at length, to make the knowledge of the CHSAs have assembled available to the general public, so as to promote the passage of legislation necessary to revitalize the militia of the several states. These committees will be of vital importance, because a timely and thorough lateral flow of information among CHSAs is essential to devise, coordinate, and refine programs aiming at a common end. Revitalizing the militia of the common states on the constitutionally correct local basis renders any form of central planning no more practical than central planning for a complex economy. Close cooperation among CHSAs mutually cross-linked in a network, however, not only is not impossible, but also must be mandatory. For the information necessary to the success of any one CHSA's activities, may often derive from the operations of other CHSAs, about which the former will know nothing absent continuous intercommunications with the latter. D. In order to develop legislation in each state, CHSAs must set up statewide statutory coordinating committees among themselves. Obviously, there can be only one statute in each state that revitalizes her militia and that statute must be completely in harmony with the goal of revitalizing the militia of the several states, according to the Constitution's original intent. To maximize the legitimacy born of historical continuity, the statute should conform to the greatest extent practicable to the principles and practices of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts. To maximize efficiency, though, the statute must be sufficiently modernized to empower and enable the state's militia to deal with every contemporary problem of homeland security that can reasonably be anticipated in that jurisdiction. So, although, as in the pre-constitutional period, a basic pattern that works in one state will probably work in all, nonetheless, as pointed out above, in its details, each statute should be tailor-made for each particular state. Not only must this statute be the product of a sound general theory, but also as a result of experimentation, it must also take into account and apply to the special problems of homeland security that may arise in that particular state. It must be complete and internally coherent, 
and overall, it must fit as easily as possible into the state's existing legislative code. To these ends, all of the CHSAs within each state should create a statewide committee to collect, collate, correlate, and critique all of the information derived from the various CHSA's practical studies, calling what is useful from what is not. On the basis of this information, and in accordance with the principles derived from the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts, the committee should develop a comprehensive militia model for the state. This model will serve as the basis for a draft bill to be submitted to the state's legislature. Refined as may be necessary through further practical studies in local CHSAs, this model will serve as the basis for a draft bill to be submitted to the state's legislature. At the minimum, the state's coordinating committee should consist of experts on constitutional law in general and the statutory law and history of the militia of the several states in particular, people well-versed in the practical considerations necessary for revitalizing the militia throughout that state, lawyers and legal researchers with highly developed analytical and critical skills who can pinpoint which parts of the state's code require additions, supplementation, amendment, or repeal in order to revitalize the militia, well-qualified legislative draftsmen, and, if at all possible, advisors drawn from among active or recently retired state legislatures or legislative staff. The goal being to assemble an experienced team that can produce the most comprehensive bill with, the, with a reasonable possibility of passage. E. Another important task for each CHSA must be constant and aggressive intergenerational recruiting. Predictably, the organizers of a CHSA without doubt, and most likely its initial leaders and members as well, will emerge from an older rather than a younger generation. This for reasons of ideology, availability, and capability. Without participation by large individuals who comprehend what traditional American patriotism actually entails, revitalization of the militia of the several states will prove impractical, if not impossible. For the militia cannot be truly revitalized unless their proponents know what the Constitution really provides understand why strict conformity to that original intent is necessary to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, and therefore are personally committed to imposing those requirements on public officials at every level of government. As a consequence of the increasingly extensive and intensive dumbing down of Americans in governmentally controlled schools since World War II, such individuals are to be found in only two groups. One, those of all ages who are essentially self-educated, but whose number, unfortunately, is probably so small as to be insufficient to revitalize the militia anywhere in the United States. And two, those of upper middle age or above, who have avoided the worst ravages of public education, and who comprise a set potentially large enough for that purpose. But inasmuch as the first group cannot be expected to expand at any significant rate, the second group is definitely dying off, and as a result, only a temporary and steadily closing window of opportunity remains. Moreover, the formation and initial operation of CHSAs will require significant personal effort, much of it without sure or sufficient monetary compensation. Indeed, the work will doubtlessly require donations of time and money from most everyone involved. Individuals who can afford and are willing to make such contributions are more likely to emerge from the ranks of the retired, the semi-retired, and those who are already successful and secure in their occupations and settled in their communities, rather than to be found among rootless, insecure, self-indulgent, and often temporarily and financially strapped youth. Yet if enlisting individuals from the present population of middle-aged and senior Americans will probably suffice initially to man and fuel the movement to revitalize the militia, it will not 
ensure success in the long run. A movement based on the particular individuals now alive in that group cannot last, because mortality is steadily culling the old patriots. Not much better would be a movement based on the hope that, as old patriots die out, an equivalent number of young ones will fortuitously mature, for such a movement will never expand significantly. And in any event, the whole exercise of attempting to revitalize the militia will serve no purpose if young Americans in ever-increasing numbers do not commit themselves to the militia, which to be constitutional must eventually enroll all of them, in every state from 16 years of age upward. I have not interjected so far in this book, but please keep in mind that the next paragraph was written pre-2007, before Ron Paul's major impact. Dr. Vieira continues, On the basis of what knowledge and experience common to America's contemporary young people, can anyone expect them to commit to the militia, to the Constitution, or to patriotism now or in the years to come? <laughs> Ron Paul phenomenon. Millions of them have been and are now being systematically destroyed, not just intellectually, but morally and spiritually as well, so that they will be incapable of standing up for their rights and performing their duties as citizens of a constitutional republic, or even of knowing or perhaps caring what those rights and duties are. That is the establishment's ulterior purpose in forcibly enrolling and indoctrinating them in public education and immersing them in popular culture. That, too, is the reason the present political regime, even while it whips up mass hysteria over homeland security, will never revitalize the militia of the several states on its own initiative. For the militia would enlist and instruct the young for purposes very different indeed for those the establishment has in mind, and would serve as alternatives, counterweights, and even antidotes to the worst of the public schools. America's youth can be saved, though, and must be saved if she is to survive, by being shown what they stand to gain by standing up for the militia, for the Constitution which recognizes and incorporates the militia, and which the militia protects, and for the free and independent nation which depends upon them both. And two, what they personally stand to lose, if they stand by passively while others go about subverting America's national independence, integrity, and identity. These lessons they can learn only from older generations that number among themselves the last Americans who understand from experience how much is at stake and how close to the final card the deck has dwindled. And these lessons, at least with respect to the militia, must be taught in CHSAs. In the little time remaining, no one else will do anything of a constructive nature anywhere else, at least not to any decisive degree. For young Americans to involve themselves to a sufficient extent in the movement to revitalize the militia, they must first be convinced of the critical importance of that effort to their own lives that nothing less than the personal participation of each and every one of them is indispensable to secure the kind of future that they all want. This will necessitate explaining, first, the need to revitalize the militia in order to establish, once and for all, true homeland security in America. That is, security for the homeland provided to the homeland by the homeland itself, through we the people's own efforts under our own control. Second, how only true homeland security can fend off the erection of a national police state that will shatter the dreams, negate the hopes, and even poison the lives of every young American. And third, how what should be done to revitalize the militia of the several states 
can be done if America's young people do it, and therefore that they must do it, because their country's survival depends upon them as it has depended on no other generations ever before. Collectively, the present younger generations are potentially the greatest generations, because they find themselves confronted with the most daunting task Americans have ever been called upon to tackle. And what they do, or fail to do, will result in the most glorious success, or the most abject failure, in this country's history. The question remains, though. How can America's young people be enticed, encouraged, enlisted, and energized to enter an environment in which they cannot avoid being educated on these matters? The answer comes from the line in the old song, How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Youth must be exposed to experiences that are engaging, entertaining, and exciting, as well as educational. Hands-on activities that will turn on their minds and tune in their hearts. America's lost generations of young people hunger for wholesome adventure, for education in real history, real politics, and real social organization, for training in martial and related skills, for honest camaraderie, for discipline and direction not to be found in their aimless, narcissistic, materialistic, hedonistic lives, and especially for an idealistic cause that demands commitment. CHSAs can and will provide such experiences in the forms of, say, workshops conducted in the evenings several times each month, and camps held on weekends during the summer or during breaks in the regular school year. Ideally, these activities should expose the participants to the widest range of practical experiences with Homeland Security problems in all four seasons. Courses of instruction should cover such subjects as the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Pre-Constitutional Militia, and other foundations of America's nationhood and her citizens' freedoms, the basic problems of homeland security, and their solutions through the militia, firearms knowledge and particularly safety, including firearms laws, identification, and operation, first aid and paramedical skills, and survival, outdoor, and disaster skills. CHSAs need not provide these programs themselves, but might simply arrange for their members and other interested individuals en masse to attend courses of instruction presented by such other independent groups, such as NRA-affiliated firearms training facilities or the Red Cross. In any event, such programs must be comprehensive and rigorous, so that participants and their parents come away with a justifiable perception that they have accomplished something special, because they have acquired knowledge and skills necessary in the present circumstances that they can use themselves as well as pass on to others. In addition, the programs should encourage participants and their parents to join an existing CHSA or to form a new one, or in some other way to support the movement for revitalization of the militia. In keeping with the practice under the Pre-Constitutional Colonial and State Militia Acts, parents and employers should defray the expenses of these workshops and camps for youths under 21 years of age. But to the extent possible, no one should be turned away simply because they cannot pay. Rather, a CHSA should solicit contributions and arrange for subsidies in order to maximize attendance. End of chapter 9